So, thank you everybody for being here. We start now our conference. I am Tatiana Bazzichelli, the director of the Disruption Network Club. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank some people that uh, uh, did this conference uh, with me. And also, I think that is really important. So we, we try to thank them all together. Uh, one is uh, the cu curator of the conference, Mauro Mondello. So I ask you, please, <laughs> to make uh, an applause. And then I want to thank deeply Kim Foss, Nada Bakker, and also Claudia Dorfmuller, that is our project manager, and that have been really working hard to make this project happening. And the Disruption Network Club is an ongoing platform of event and research that is focused uh, uh, on art and media disruption. And uh, we are now at our 12 conference <laughs> that uh, I, uh, I mean, we have actually been working two years to make this thing happen. And uh, that is why I feel really, again, to thank Mauro because we did a lot of work together. And uh, I mean, not only because the topic is not easy as you can imagine and you know, uh, but also because this year we have been really struggling with our funding. So I also want to tell you, because uh, often these things are never mentioned, and I think instead it's important to say that uh, on the back there is a lot of hard work just to make the thing happen. Uh, but at the end we manage, so <laughs> we are here. And uh, that is why I also feel that it's really important uh, to thank our funders uh, that decide to support us. And uh, the first is the Riva and David Logan Foundation. Um, and we got uh, the grants uh, also thanks to Neo Philanthropy that provided it. Then uh, we thank the Mozilla Foundation, the Berta Foundation, and the Checkpoint Charlie Foundation. Um, I also want to thank uh, other supporter institutions, uh, the Radicalization Awareness Network, and also the Open Society Justice Initiative that uh, support with us with the presence of some speakers. And then, of course, our cooperation partner, the Kunst von Kreuzberg Bethanien, Spectrum, that has been really important for our pre-event, and also Supermarket Berlin, in which we will do the workshop uh, on Sunday. Um, also, I have to tell you that there are still places for this workshop, so you can register at the entrance when you want during the break. I also thank our collaboration partners, the Alexander von Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society, and also our media partners, Ex Berliner and Furterfield. Um, with this conference that we decide to entitle Terror Feeds Inside the Fear Machine, we are dealing uh, with topics that are not always easy to deal with, but uh, we decide to f specifically uh, focus on certain um, matters that we found really important, uh, so especially nowadays. Um, so, of course, we are speaking about ISIS or Daesh by its Arabic, Arabic language acronym and its media strategy, the meaning of cyber jihad, why people enroll as foreign fighters, and the change ISIS represents in how terrorism is conducted. At the same time, we also want to focus on strategies that activists and human rights advocates use to oppose this form of terror. And uh, I also want to give you a bit of background in our curatorial strategy, because as I say, it's a long time we are working on it, and we have been uh, discussing a lot uh, even on the use of certain words, um, because uh, certain words, I think, needs to be questioned. And uh, I think that during this event, we also will try to do that. Uh, we were even saying uh, and reflecting whether we should use the word ISIS or Daesh, or uh, the problematic word of cyber jihad. And then we also decided to call a panel exactly with this word, and then terror as well is something that we need to question. And our decision was to use these critical words also because we think that is important because they are critical to use them. And otherwise we will only leave them on the space 
of people that still we want to try to understand, investigate, and also question. So we say we are exactly to use this word because we need to deconstruct them, we need to understand them, and I think it's also our responsibility, not only as curator, but also as a public, as speakers, to try to better understand this phenomenon that we are analyzing. And uh, I think and hope that at the end of these two days, uh, many words will be more clear, or at least we will uh, acquire more knowledge on a, on a matter that I have to say not many people want to speak about. So in a sense, we took this challenge, and I hope that uh, at the end, uh, you know, will be important for many of us. So I want to start now introducing uh, uh, the keynote, but first of all, I want to introduce the moderator that will then explain better what the keynote is about. That is uh, Mauro Mondello, and is also the co-curator of this conference. So I ask him, please, to come on stage. And uh, while he's coming, <laughs> I also want to introduce him and uh, uh, tell you a bit uh, an anecdote that is always fun to say uh, because it's the way we actually met each other. We met uh, two years ago uh, because both of us got the prize of Italian of the years <laughs> and we got it from the Italian Embassy Committees and uh, the Italian Culture Institute. So in this occasion we basically met and I had this idea of doing this conference in a really long time, and finally I found the right person to do it. Because uh, uh, Mauro is a freelance uh, journalist, is a writer and a documentary filmmaker based in Berlin, and is the founder and editor-in-chief of Janet's magazine. He works as a correspondent for La Repubblica, Avenire, Radio Rai, Panorama, Rivista Studio, East Zeit, Mag uh, East Zeit Magazine, and also especially is covering on these uh, um, various media the subject of Middle East. And in 2011, he followed the Arab Revolution in Syria, Libya, Yemen, Tunisia, and Egypt, and uh, he authored two documentaries. One is named Stateless from 2012, that he did in collaboration with videomaker Nunzio Gringeri, that is a study of uh, Tunisia Shosha refugee camp. And the second one instead is from 2015. The name is Lampedusa in Berlin, and is about the refugee protest camp in Berlin at Oranian Platz. Um, so now I leave uh, Mauro <laughs> the duty to introduce the panel and the next uh, two spe the, the, the keynote. Um, and uh, yes, thank again for being with us, and thank you, Mauro, and the speakers that will follow. So, good evening to everybody. Thanks, Tatiana, for the nice presentation. And uh, before to introduce the keynote, I would like to uh, call on the stage Sue Tarton and Charlie Winter, that will be our speakers for our first uh, keynote. Um, Sue Tarton is a journalist and uh, reporter. She has been working for Channel 4 uh, for a long time, and then she has been reporting for Al Jazeera from all the Arab world, Libya, Egypt, Syria, Tunisia, and uh, many other countries in the Arab world in uh, conflict uh, moments. And uh, today she's freelancing and she just published a book about uh, activism. Charlie Winter is a senior uh, research fellow at the International Center for, um, for the study of radicalization and political uh, violence in the AG. It's a very long, <laughs> yeah, it's a very long name. And, uh, is a research focus mainly on the, on uh, media and media strategies of terrorist group in the world, and with a specific concentration on uh, ISIS. Uh, what we are talking, what we would like to do during this keynote is, uh, in order to uh, understand what is ISIS is, uh, the first thing to do is to comprehend 
uh, a lot of things, especially we need to comprehend uh, when and where everything started and uh, how the strategy, the media strategy and the field strategy of this group works. This is very important because ISIS is a different uh, terrorist group. It's something that, uh, that uh, we never experience. Why? Because uh, I would say it's kind of a fluid organization. It's, uh, it's a group uh, that, uh, of course, has a very specific area where it works, but it, if it, we just think that they started in Afghanistan and then they moved to Iraq and then again in Syria, and then they have a lot of uh, uh, affiliates all around the world, we understand immediately that the way we are talking about something that is very different from every other organization that we have been studying and that we've been uh, exploring and analyzing during, during the years. So this is what we will do tonight during this keynote and that's why I uh, leave now the microphone to Sue that we'll start with our keynote. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to start with this image. Uh, five years ago this very week, uh, photographer James Foley and I were both traveling through uh, a town called Binish in northwestern Syria. Fairly unremarkable town. Um, the only reason that I'd stopped off, having just arrived in Syria, being smuggled across the border, as we had to at that stage of the war, uh, was to pick up provisions. I was with the brother of a free Syrian army commander who was taking me deep into Jabal Zawiya, uh, the mountainous region of Idlib, to try and find out what was happening on the battlefront and talk to the communities there. And it was always useful to have biscuits and sweets because the soldiers could be bribed with biscuits and sweets, so we were picking up plenty of those. James Foley was coming the other way. Uh, he'd been in. Uh, doing his work and he needed to send some emails before he left I'm guessing to try and sell his pictures um, I passed through without any problem um, James didn't James was uh, stopped by three men in a van and snatched kidnapped uh, and many months later was handed over to a group that would become uh, what we now know as ISIS um, up until ISIS came along, we as journalists often managed to straddle the front line in Afghanistan. Um, as likely, I, I'd be having the phone clumped to my ear on a breaking story talking to the foreign forces, the ISAF. My producer would have a phone on one ear talking to the press officer for the Afghan president. And in the other ear, he'd have the Taliban spokesperson. Similar in Syria. This particular trip, I was at the Free Syrian Army, escorted, protected. But on other trips, I'd gone in with Jabhat al-Nusra, who, whereas the Free Syrian Army are backed by the West, Jabhat al-Nusra are seen as a terrorist organization by America, an Al-Qaeda affiliate. But Jabhat al-Nusra wanted to get their message out, especially with someone like Al Jazeera. They trusted that they wouldn't just get slammed, uh, as they often did in the Western press. Um, this is what had changed, really, and I think we didn't realize at the time that we weren't needed by ISIS or the group that would become ISIS because they didn't want their message getting out. They were using social media for that. At this point, this chap here was the one that gave me the key to Jabhat al-Nusra. Um, he uh, gave me the okay to go into uh, the fighting areas that they were fighting in. His name is Abu Hamad. Um, and again, he realized he needed to get his message out. But his group was changing at this stage. Um, at this stage, he had pulled in a lot of foreign fighters. Um, and they were the ones, I think, that were making the difference in northern Syria at the time. And in very much particular, that day that we went in, to cover the fighting that was going on. I'm just gonna play this report from there and then talk a little bit about the people that were fighting for him. Loading up their winnings after taking Syria's largest helicopter base. 
These are Jabhat al-Nusra fighters, one of five independent rebel groups to overrun Taft and Az Air Base, something the FSA had failed to do over the past two months of pitched battles. It took two days of intense fighting. According to a defected lieutenant, 200 government soldiers were still holed up in two buildings inside the airport. In the end, they either ran away or were captured by the rebel groups. Also captured, helicopters, still working, left stranded on the tarmac. We surrounded it for seven days and then we stormed the base. Fighters from Jabr al-Nusra, al-Har al-Sham, al tariya Islamiyah and others. As you can see, we have won victory. But the commander was cut short. As we were interviewing Jabhat al-Nusra's leader, we could hear MiGs flying overhead. Everybody scrambled. We're now hiding in a building. It's clear that even though the fighters have taken control of Taft and Az Air Base, the regime is sending fighter jets to try and take it back. Victory for the anti-government forces would mean an end to daily attacks on free Syrian army positions and towns and villages throughout Idlib province launched from this airbase. Among the Jabhat al-Nusra fighters, one man told us he was from North Africa, others from Egypt, Tunisia and Libya. I asked the commander whether Jabhat al-Nusra was affiliated to al-Qaeda. Why is the West criticizing al-Qaeda? Why are they against al-Qaeda? They criticize al-Qaeda because they fight for their rights. Whether we are al-Qaeda or not, we're Muslims. We fight for our rights and won't give them away. We are Jabr al-Nusra. If we are with al-Qaeda or not, we will fight for our rights. We waited for the Arab League and the U.S. Have you seen them accomplish anything? I asked if they would now hand over Taftanaz to the Free Syrian Army. He said the regime originally stole this land from the farmers and the peasants. Perhaps they should now get it back. Suturton Al Jazeera. So you might think, why are you showing us pictures of Jabhat al Nusra fighters? Well, I think one of the key things to remember about ISIS is they're not that's this sudden terror group that, that came down from Mars. They're not suddenly a, a homogenous uh, bunch of uh, bloodthirsty guys who have the same ideology, ideology. They are guys like this lot here that were pulled away from perhaps the, the groups that they were fighting with before. Um, they are guns for hire, a lot of them. That's a lot of the reason that ISIS was so successful, because it brought in seasoned fighters that knew what they were doing on the battlefield. And a lot of those guys that you see there, even though their leader might not have joined ISIS, a lot of the fighters did. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. Let's just go back 14 years. Um, and for any insurgency to really succeed, um, it needs to be pushing against something. And what ISIS pushed against, or at least the beginnings of ISIS, was the Americans. Uh, there is no greater symbol, really, as to the, the ripping apart of Saddam Hussein's Iraq after the 2003 invasion than this particular statue. Um, what the... Uh, what the Americans, what the coalition forces did was destroy patronage, power structure that had been going on for centuries. Um, and by ripping that apart, it obviously left a power vacuum. Um, but what also did was sack the Ba'ath Party. It ripped apart the Ba'ath Party structure. The commanders that had fought for Saddam Hussein for so long uh, the officials that worked within his government, many Sunnis who had been in power and very well respected, suddenly were left out in the cold with nothing and were emasculated, is possibly the right word for it. At the same time, there was an extremist effort going on, Wahhabism, Salafism. There was a, a real push to see the Americans on the streets in Iraq and the way that the Sunnis were being treated and recruit to this extremist ideology, this jihadism. Now, quite cleverly, the authorities at the time tried to push back on this and they managed to create this awakening. The groups of Sunni tribal leaders that didn't want to be part of Al-Qaeda, that didn't want to be part of this jihadist insurgent group, 
And the awakening in different communities did manage to push down what was the beginnings of the Islamic State of Iraq. Um, and they were quite successful at, at doing this. And it did look for a while that things were calming down on the streets of Iraq. And then they made a colossal error. They set up a camp in the southern Iraq called Camp Bukha. Camp Bukha was supposed to do everything that Abu Ghraib had done wrong, right. All those atrocious images of abuse of inmates that did so much damage uh, to the authorities in Iraq. Camp Bukha did the opposite. They had lectures trying to de-radicalize people they thought were extremists. They had medical programs for them. They were supposed to respect the inmates. But what happened was a, a mass internment of people that were described even of looking suspicious, thrown into Camp Bukha, at the height as many as 24,000 inmates in Camp Bukha. And it became a jihadist school. What I was described by one person was an incubator for insurgency. Because they put all of these extremists and moderates together in this camp, and the extremists made hay while the sun shine. And 18, that's this Kambuka, they now think um, there were Ba'ath Party commanders alongside jihadists coming up with some sort of plot. And 18 out of the 27 senior ISIS leaders, they believe, were in Camp Bukha. And the most famous is Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi was described by one American soldier to me as a very um, nice inmate, um, helpful inmate who would, who would talk to the extremists on the Americans' behalf and try to you know, bring them to their way of thinking, whereas what was really going on was they were recruiting. And as quickly as this mass internment began, they emptied Camp Bukha, throwing all of these uh, inmates like a ticking time bomb onto the streets of Iraq. And what they did was they went back into their Sunni communities and they started to ferment an uprising. They started to get involved with the Sunnis who were feeling that they were disaffected and weren't being looked after by the new Shia government, by the Maliki government who was abusing its power towards the Sunnis at every level. And at the same time this was going on, events in Syria conspired in ISIS's favor because Northern Africa was on fire with the Arab uprisings. And in response to that, a group of teenagers in Dara, in Syria, wrote on the school wall, Bashar al-Assad, you will be next. And the response by the state was severe, took those teenagers and threw them in prison. And protests started to pop up against their imprisonment, peaceful protests. And the armed insurgents, realized that this was their chance in Syria to take that peaceful protest and to use it to turn the people towards them in the, in the similar way that had been happening in Camp Bukha. The extremists went in to convert the moderates. Um, and that's what happened in Syria. And I won't forget the first day I first bumped into the extremists when I thought I was going to be surrounded by a free Syrian army. And that wasn't the case. One man said it was like an earthquake. Bombs, rockets, mortars raining down on this town for the past two weeks. There's an airbase 10 kilometers away. Government forces there had sent a message to the people. If you fire a single bullet, we will flatten your town. They stayed true to their word. The MiG flew from the airport near us, and when it hit us, people were still in their homes. This is how they use collective punishment. The locals say this street was full of people shopping when the MiGs and helicopters began dropping their bombs. 25,000 people lived in this town, 
You can still smell the bodies of those still in the rubble who didn't manage to get away. Lotus and Chopki Bar, supermarket, 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 and uh, supermarket uh, shoes. Rami explains which shop sold what. Um, how long ago? How many days ago was this? How long ago? Five. Five days five, ago. Five. Five. Yes. Five. Honestly, yes. As we filmed, a pickup truck pulled up. The FSA fighters and the doctor who escorted us here urged that we leave immediately. This, they said, was Abu Taha, a local Al Qaeda leader. The atmosphere had changed. As we drove away, the doctor said many local rebels had joined Al Qaeda because they had money and weapons. The FSA is broke. They couldn't say where Al Qaeda's money is coming from or who is backing them. On the next street, the remains of a three-story house. Twelve people died here. Nine are still buried. Bashar the dog destroyed our homes. I worked my whole life to build this house. By hiding in these streets, the rebels brought an onslaught of bombs and artillery onto this town. The women, the children, the old men committed no crime, but they have been punished. Suterton, Al Jazeera, Abu Dahur in Syria. So, at the same time that the, obviously the Al Qaeda insurgents were going into Syria to try and turn it into a jihadist conflict, which they succeeded in, um, I. ISI, which we'll still call them at this point, Islamic State of Iraq, was trying to um, stir up the Sunni communities, as I said, um, against the Shia government. And there were suicide bomb attacks going across the nation as well. And it became as bloody as it ever had been. And then Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi has a, a, a number two um, called Haji Bakr, a very shadowy figure. Uh, and he was very busy in Syria at the time, recruiting. And this is what I was mentioning earlier. They were pulling in seasoned fighters from the Balkans and from Chechnya, uh, which really worried the Russians. Um, Central Asia, Middle East, and North Africa, like those fighters who were busy uh, in Taftanaz when we were there with Jabhat al-Nusra. Um, and all of these, I mean, we often think if we're living in a, a Western uh, country that because the news just talks about those recruits that have gone across from our country, that that's really where the bulk of the recruits were coming from. But it really was much more extensive than that. And this is the time that Baghdadi decides to make his move. The, all that planning in Camp Bukha, all that preparation. He dismisses Al-Qaeda's authority, basically says they're done. He says Jabhat al-Nusra has joined their ranks, which some of their leaders dispute, but many of the fighters did join. Um, and he calls himself the Islamic State of Iraq and Al-Sham, Syria, or the Levant, whichever one you want to choose. Um, and the caliphate, if you like, is born. Haji Bakr, his deputy emir, starts on uh, creating this caliphate. They set up a police state. Raqqa is one of their main bases. Charity fronts are set up to be their eyes and ears in towns across Iraq and Syria. They instruct some of their fighters to marry some of the, the tribal elders' daughters, really trying to put themselves right in the middle of communities. Um, and even I, I remember being in towns close to Mosul, and the, the, those that had escaped had explained to us how they'd come into their villages and they demanded. Uh, they hand over all their crops or they had to pay so much money in taxes. I mean, they really were setting up a state, a nation of their own. Um, and then the push came into Iraq. And a lot of people have asked, how come 600 ISIS fighters can overpower 120,000 Iraqi army, um, six divisions of weaponry, and just they melt away? Uh, it was described to me that the Iraqi army wasn't actually an army at all. It was a machine for making money for the officers. And I'm sure you've all held, heard of ghost, ghost soldiers, where there are names of soldiers in units um, 
who are getting paid every month, but they don't exist. It's all going into the back pockets of the officers. And another area I suppose we should mention is that the commitment wasn't really there by those Iraqi soldiers to fight back. They, they didn't believe in their army. They didn't believe in their commanders. So the only people really that were holding the line were the Shia militia under the guise of the Iranian generals. One of the key areas, I think, also of the reason that they did manage to push so easily is they have this dual tactic that they are incredibly good on the battlefront because they have the former Ba'ath Party commanders who joined in with the, the jihadists to create ISIS. And they know how to fight. I've been on the front line between Iraq and Syria and the commander of the Peshmerga said, I can hear a man on the radio who now fights for ISIS that I used to fight alongside during the American invasion, who used to be an Iraqi Ba'ath Party commander. So they're great on the battlefront, but they're also great when it comes to an insurgency. North of Mosul, a town called Zuma, we were outside of as the Peshmerga took it, pushed ISIL back into Mosul. And the Peshmerga was celebrating on the streets when this APC, this armored personnel carrier, came towards them with a flag of their, their flag flying. And they were thinking, that doesn't look right. And the next minute it blew up and killed 18 of them, spooked them. They fled Zuma, ISIS took it back. So this switch from battlefront to insurgency is incredibly powerful. And again, not really something that we've seen uh, before in other conflicts. But the, the other vital area is that they rely on the Sunni communities to, to hide them. Um, the Sunni communities might not want them there, but are they going to push back? Are they too afraid to push back? Or do they prefer them there to the Shia? In a building site in the south of Kirkuk City, Kurdish special forces follow up on a tip-off that an ISIL sleeper cell is hiding here. They soon discover a container buried underground, hidden inside a large cache of weapons, ammunition and explosives. Three men were at the site. They'd reportedly just moved to Kirkuk after fleeing the fighting in their village and had boasted to the officers that they were ISIL. The men and the evidence were handed over to the local Iraqi police to be processed and sent to the courts, but the Kurdish security officers had little hope the suspects would be convicted. Many judges at the courts told us that their homes are in the south and are not protected, so ISIL attacks them. Others are too afraid to put their families in danger, as they've been getting death threats. We also found that some of the judges are Arab Sunnis and are nationalistic. That's why they released them. The Sunni Arab population in Kokuk province has increased enormously over the past few months, as over 100,000 have fled the fighting and made Kirkuk their new home. It's become a nervous city, with the security forces finding it difficult to track down those suspected of being loyal to ISIL hiding in this community. There are two kinds of Sunni Arabs. Some are in league with ISIL and some are against them. It's very important for us to give updated information to the airstrike so they don't attack the wrong side. That's crucial for us. We have very good relations with some of the Arab tribes. We're also telling them to stay away from ISIL. We don't want to turn them into our enemy. The front line is just 30 kilometers outside of the city. I've been asked to keep my voice down because we are so close to the ISIL position. It's just 50 metres away across the river here. The problem the fighters have of clearing this area is there are 45 Sunni Arab villagers living in these three villages across the way and they don't want to kill the civilians. The civilians are saying we can't force ISIL out of our villages. A coalition airstrike hit a vehicle across the river three days ago, killing four, including two senior ISIL commanders. But the coalition's operations hub won't launch attacks where civilians are still living. And they cannot help to weed out ISIL sleeper cells. Only a fully functioning security and judicial system can hope to do that. Sue Turton, Al Jazeera, Kirkuk. And so, as I touched on just before that, um, what we were seeing 
pushing back against the Sunnis was the Shia. Um, these are the people that held the line. These are the people that, that stopped Baghdad and Erbil from being overrun by ISIL. But this is, I think, really what ISIS wanted to happen because what that then did was create an even more of a sectarian divide. It became a battle between Sunni and Shia. Now, Al-Qaeda had never created that battle. With Al-Qaeda, it was the hatred of the West and specifically the US. But what ISIS was doing was driving a wedge between the two sides of Islam. And by basically seeing the Shia come in and um, taking back the land for the Iraqi government, it was pushing the Sunni even more into a corner. Uh, and the inevitable happened. Um, the Shia started to take revenge. A Shia militia checkpoint in an Arab sunny area northwest of Amali. We've been told men from this group, the Badr Brigade, are looting and torching villages here after residents allowed Islamic State fighters to hide out. Nine days earlier, the same militia had welcomed us into the town. They had fought alongside the Iraqi army and the Peshmerga to break the siege. Today, the atmosphere is very different. We're told to pull over. An armored pickup truck blocks our exit, and militiamen aim sniper rifles, rocket-propelled grenades, and AK-47s straight at us. We've been trying to negotiate our way through this Shia militia checkpoint for the last half an hour. There are also Peshmerga fighters on the same checkpoint, but it's very clear it's the Shia militia that make the decisions here, and they're very reluctant to let us go through. We're trying to get to film a village that they've apparently flattened and, and torched, a village that used to have Sunni Arabs living in it. Eventually, they let us through. The Peshmerga say the Sunni mosque we pass was shelled by the militia. We arrive in the Arab Sunni village of Yangija. It's deserted. Houses have been torched. One is still smouldering. The Peshmerga has a position close by, but they are now pulling out, leaving the militia in total control. The commander says his men respect the Arab Sunni house they've set up camp in. We are giving our lives to unite Iraq to protect all people's property, but others are not doing this, in particular the Badr organization. This is not acceptable. The Peshmerga has gone house to house dismantling improvised explosive devices left by IS fighters. This one had command wires buried under the road. They even found explosives left under a toilet seat. Our Peshmerga escort then takes us to the nearby town of Tuskamatu, where they tell us the Shia fighters beheaded an Arab Sunni resident. When we witnessed that, it made us angry. We cannot accept this. We told them if it happens again, we will fight you. It's not acceptable. We ordered them to stop and they promised to do so. But the Shia militia don't take orders from them. One Peshmerga commander filmed this man on the day Amelie fell. He's giving orders in Iranian Farsi. The commander witnessed many Iranian fighters alongside the Iraqi Shia. In a response to these accusations, the spokesman for the Badr organization said, there are absolutely no such revenge attacks on Sunni. We've liberated the towns that were taken by IS on a completely national level, regardless of ethnic or sectarian background. The forces, which you call militia, are recognized by the Iraqi army on an official level, and the Badr Corps and the Mahdi Army Peace Brigade and others are all under the Iraqi army command. Um, let's talk about Turkey. Um, could ISIS have evolved in the way it did and indeed keep on growing without the help of Turkey? No, it couldn't. Um, at one point, ISIS was making what was believed to be between $3 million and $4 million a day in oil revenue. And the reason they were making that was because these trucks were going in and out of Turkey and Syria and flogging that oil. But not just that, there was a, f a flow of weapons and people and ammunition going in to Iraq and Syria, and that flow was across the Turkish border. Um, as far as the Kurds were concerned, 
they were pushing against ISIS in uh, northern um, Iraq and Syria. But the Kurds are enemy number one as far as Turkey is concerned. And if ISIS was holding back the Kurds at all, then in a way, they were doing Turkey's job for them. Now, the international community was putting a lot of pressure on Turkey to close its border. Um, unfortunately, he didn't do that for quite a long time. Uh, and it came to, to bite back Turkey. Um, I did manage to talk to a, um, an ISIL um, trafficker, people and weapons trafficker, uh, sometime later. And he explained exactly how easy it had been to get people and weapons in and out. A student in northern Syria films his journey towards a Turkish border crossing, a journey he's made many times. It's possible to leave legally with the correct documents or illegally without for the right amount of money. I found a good smuggler who always helped me for a sizable amount of money. I don't have a larger amount to travel through the official border. Going the other way appears to be open too. Al Jazeera secretly spoke to a man at one border crossing who said he is a smuggler. If you want to go the illegal way, it'll be 75 to 100 Turkish lira. From here, we take 150. He just has to jump over the fence and he'll be across the border. He'll walk next to the trucks. He gives 1,000 lira to the Syrian driver and he'll pick him up. Will the border close? Every day. Every day it's open. The Turkish police say the Istanbul bomber crossed the border illegally. This man says he is a former ISIL smuggler who provided weapons in Syria for fighters from Chechnya and Dagestan. He says the Turkish border into ISIL-held territory is the only way in and out for fighters. It's like Daesh is sitting in a room with no windows but one door. Even if Turkey closes the door a little, Daesh won't break down that door because they still hope in the following days Turkey will reopen the door fully. The houses in the distance are in ISIL-controlled territory in Syria and it's the 100 kilometer stretch to the east of here along the border that is effectively the front door to Turkey and Europe for ISIL fighters. The United States had called on the Turkish government to station a 30,000 strong border patrol there but Turkey said it couldn't afford the spare troops. So business for the network of ISIL smugglers remains brisk. The network of smugglers uh, for ISIL seems very organized. Totally. Groups come freely into Istanbul. They travel by bus, not planes, to Kilis or Ehangli via Gaziantep, where they meet up. There's a man responsible for managing hotel bookings and their transport, and another for entry into Syria. 68 ISIL suspects have been detained across Turkey since the Istanbul attack. The interior minister says Turkey is committed to tracking down ISIL sympathizers as part of the government's anti-terrorism operation. A week before the Sultan Ahmed attacks, 220 suspected ISIL members were detained. Until now, Turkey has detained 3,318 as part of our counter-terrorism operation since the conflict began in Syria. Out of these, 847 were arrested. A significant number are foreign fighters. Sealing the border completely is a tall order for Turkey. It's the first port of call for Syrians trying to escape the humanitarian disaster of the civil war. If the Istanbul attack is a sign of an increase in insurgent attacks on Turkish soil, then the Turkish government may have to now consider closing the door completely. Sutan and Al Jazeera. And of course it did close the door, maybe not completely, but because of so much pressure from the West. Um, just lastly, before we quickly look at what's happening now, we should probably mention the, the fact that Syria and Iraq to an extent is in the middle of an international dogfight for regional control. It's not just Turkey. It's Iran, it's Russia, it's the West. There are so many countries trying to get their own influence in that region in their proxy warmongering. Um, but of course that effort to be involved in some respects brought down at least ISIS caliphate. It's not brought down ISIS in Iraq and Syria completely. They estimate as many as 10,000 ISIS fighters are still in those two countries. But it squeezed them out of there, so they're popping up elsewhere. Um, 
we understand there are ISIS fighters in at least nine provinces in Afghanistan. Um, they're in Libya, they're on the Niger Mali uh, border. Um, the UN's reporting that there is an increased amount of ISIS in Somalia, and if any of you have watched the news today, there has been an enormous um, attack in northern Sinai. Um, at least 235 people killed in a mosque there. Uh, ISIS not claimed responsibility, but they are usually very busy in the northern Sinai region. Um, I, one other place I suppose I should mention, I was in Marawi in the Philippines this summer, um, where the Maute brothers uh, had taken control of Marawi in a very violent, bloody siege with a gentleman called Ypsilon Hapilon, who was announced two years ago as the emir of ISIS in Southeast Asia. Uh, very much on the rise in that area, ISIS announced anybody from that area, uh, Southeast Asia, that was in their group should go to the Philippines as it was now their base in that region. But anywhere there's disaffection is at risk. Um, extremists are even portraying um, what's going on with the Rohingya in Myanmar and pushing them into Bangladesh uh, as a war against Muslims. The caliphate might have gone, but the ideology, the cult, I like to call them, it's not a religion, uh, is still appealing to all those disaffected Muslim communities and I think until we stop isolating Muslims, until we stop demonizing their faith, then ISIS is gonna have this easy ability to recruit and radicalize, um, whether it be joining them or lone wolves committing atrocities, atrocities across our, our capitals. Thank you. Um, thanks everyone for uh, coming along. Thank you for inviting me to this. Ooh, I think we're right. I'm going to talk to you today about work. This one's better. This one. Is that better? Okay. I'm going to talk to you today about work that I've been doing over the last few years, trying to piece together the puzzle that is the Islamic State's propaganda strategy. Obviously, the group is notorious for the media that it's been producing over the last few years, particularly notorious for the extreme brutality uh, of its media, but it's a much, much bigger puzzle than that. And in the next few minutes, I'm gonna try and walk you through what the Islamic State has been doing and also talk about how it's changed over the last few years, in particular, looking at the last couple of weeks. So there are gonna be three main parts to this. First, I'm gonna talk through some data uh, I'll try and make it interesting. I think it's interesting. Then I'm going to talk through some trends. Uh, so we're looking at a very different Islamic State now to what it was a few years ago. So I think there could be some very large strategic um, shifts in what the group is doing that I think we've seen the beginning of over the last couple of years, actually. It's gradually been moving towards this moment. So I'll talk about what those are. Then finally, I will touch upon some implications of, of not only the Islamic State's media decline, but this kind of shift in strategic trajectory. So first of all, this is a, a screenshot of Telegram. So Telegram is this uh, not particularly marginal social network platform now, which is it's very popular for lots and lots of different people, not just Salafi jihadists, they, they like it, the Islamic State likes it but it's used by activists, pro-democracy activists in Iran in particular, but all over. And it essentially offers something like a mixture of WhatsApp, a mixture of Facebook, Twitter, brings them all together, gives it a bit of, a bit of encryption, and it also happens to be very, very useful for sharing propaganda. So this is the initial source of all Islamic State media. Uh, everything you see in the news, whether it's an operation claim, a video, photo report, you don't really see those in the media, but anything that the Islamic State's official media infrastructure produces, it comes through Telegram. 
Here is a, a couple of screenshots um, from uh, just a day's worth of photos from Telegram. So they all come through, again, the, the official channels there. And the focus here is overwhelmingly on military stuff. We've got a few uh, mortar, uh, mortar attacks and suicide bombers, operation claims, and so on. Um, but again, the Islamic State brand is much more than just this military thing, or at least it has been over the last few years. This uh, screenshot here was from just earlier this year when the Islamic State had already shifted away from emphasizing its apparent utopia, its purported utopia, and it was focusing more and more on military stuff. But I'll get onto that shift in a second. This is just a screenshot of, uh, of Excel where I spend far too much time trying to come up with the figures to put into the graphs that I will now describe. So I want to talk first of all about output. The Islamic State is profoundly good at making propaganda. And I don't just mean that because it can like, do Hollywood style things. I don't just mean it because it's slick. I mean it because it makes a huge amount of material. Or it has been making a huge amount of material at least. And managing to uniformly brand it, managing to make sure that everything stays within the same narrative parameters, managing to make sure that whether it's from West Africa or Libya or Syria or Iraq or Southeast Asia or Afghanistan or Somalia or Egypt, that media tells the same story. It tells exactly what the Islamic State wants it to tell. Now, that's quite a feat of engineering, and I don't think anyone quite knows how they've been able to do that. It's been interesting watching it over the last few years, though, because it's clearly become very, very difficult for them to keep up what they were doing a few years ago. And you can see just by looking at the top level figures. So this is just the output. So in a, in a given month, uh, this first one was August 2015. It was actually the month of Shawal uh, in the Hijri year 1436, which is straddles July and August 2015. But over the course of that month, the Islamic State produced no fewer than 892 separate bits of propaganda. So I'm talking about videos, photo reports, uh, radio bulletins, um, audio statements, that kind of thing. I'm not just talking about individual photographs. These are entire propaganda events. Now, if we fast forward 18 months to February 2017, so this is going from when the Islamic State was arguably at the zenith of its influence, territorial and ideological in uh, Iraq and Syria, and beginning to be in the rest of the world too. If we fast forward 18 months to February 2017, the Islamic State was in a very, very different situation. It had lost a, a, a stream of very important towns across Iraq and Syria. It was in the middle of a fight that it was definitely losing for Mosul. It was losing territory in northern Syria. The Islamic State was struggling, and you could tell that from its propaganda. In February 2017, it was two, uh, a third less productive than it had been uh, just 18 months earlier. And then if we move forward even more to September 2017, it was another third less productive. As the operating environment within Iraq and Syria, the offline environment within Iraq and Syria has become more difficult for the Islamic State as an organization conducting an insurgency, so too has it been more difficult for it to produce propaganda. Similarly, this shift in direction can be seen in the brand that the Islamic State has. So I said earlier it's not just about brutality. Well, for a very long time, the Islamic State was trying to emphasize the fact that you could go to live in Iraq and Syria, not just fight and die in Iraq and Syria, but as a foreign fighter, or indeed as a fighter from Syria or Iraq, you could go and join it and actually have a life. You could engage in its industrial activities and its agricultural activities. Children were being educated, and religious services were being given, social benefits were being given out. That was the priority of the Islamic State propagandists a couple of years ago. Over half of all of their propaganda was geared towards looking at this civilian governance stuff. Now, again, fast forward to February 2017, the operating environment had changed, the Islamic State's strategic parameters had changed. It was looking to do something else. It was aware that it couldn't keep claiming that the civilian caliphate, the civilian utopia, was still, uh, was still being sustained in any, anywhere near as uh, fluid a state as it was a couple of years earlier. So instead, the shift was towards military stuff. It began to focus more on its insurgent operations, more on its ability to inflict pain on its enemies, be they in Syria or Iraq or outside of the caliphate as well. Again, fast forwarding to September, so just this September just gone, it's still focusing 
on this military stuff. Now, what's been interesting over the last couple of months uh, in particular, so October and November, is it's as if someone has pressed mute on all of this stuff. Yes, the Islamic State is still producing media, but it's really collapsed almost entirely. So what was a flood turned into a trickle, and then that trickle has turned into a few drips every single day. It's as if they have had to, well, I'm just wondering whether at the moment they're literally transporting their media center elsewhere because they've lost Raqqa, lost Mayor Dean, lost Abu Kamal, and so on and so forth. Now, this is a, a map, I guess, of, um, it's quite confusing to look at, but this is the Islamic State's media machine. So uh, I know Eamon's going to be talking about uh, the document that much of this map is built off of um, in, his, uh, in his talk, but essentially this uh, gives you an idea of the scale of this, this uh, massive infrastructure. So I won't bother going through, uh, through what all of the different uh, levels of it mean, but essentially around the outside, the colorful boxes, they each relate to a provincial media office. So, yes, the Islamic State has been framing itself as this transnational caliphate for the last few years. It's been really emphasizing, uh, as much as it can, its affiliates in West Africa, Egypt, Afghanistan, Southeast Asia, and so on, as well as its, uh, its heartlands in Iraq and Syria. Now, for the month of September, I thought it would be interesting to remove, strip away the media offices that were dormant, to see how the Islamic State looks now compared to when it was at its maximum. So I'll just do that in the next couple of slides. The first in the bottom left is the Syrian, uh, Syrian uh, provincial offices. And you can see a few of those go, not too many go, but a few of those go. These are, all, these are outlets that have been dormant essentially for the course of that month. So next we'll remove the Iraqi ones. And that's a few more. Now for the Yemeni ones in the bottom right. And then there's a whole row from uh, Bahrain over to uh, Caucasus. Uh, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Southeast Asia, West Africa, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, and so on. They were all dormant in the month of September as well. And then also plenty of the central outlets as well. They were silent too. So the Islamic State of a few years ago no longer exists. It hasn't disappeared, but it has lost the capability that it had a few years ago. And I think it's very important when you hear politicians still going on about the virtual caliphate, really going on about the virtual caliphate, perhaps exaggerating the potency of propaganda and exaggerating the scale of propaganda as well. I think there needs to be something of a reality check there because we do have a tendency to be sensationalist about the Islamic State's propaganda. It is formidable, it is very formidable, but it must not be exaggerated. Um, now, for a couple of trends, so these are strategic shifts in the Islamic State brand, if you like, that I've noticed not just happening in the last few months. These have been happening since probably mid-2016. This is when I first began to notice that the Islamic State was really shifting the promise that it was, uh, the promise that it was making to supporters inside and outside of uh, Iraq and Syria. So the first of these is this idea of nostalgia. So yes, the Islamic State would emphasize this civilian utopia. I've been through that, we talk about its military prowess and all that. But it began to get more difficult to do that. It couldn't do the same, uh, do the same thing, keep doing the same thing when it was losing as much territory as it was. And I think its media strategists, the people who are making the decisions about what to focus on and what not to focus on, I think they began to hedge. They began to cultivate this sense of preemptive nostalgia. Now, in a lot of the publications that the Islamic State releases, there's these long-winded essays that essentially try to frame what's been happening in the last couple of years as a new golden age of Islam. So they pretend or make out as if they have been emulating the uh, rightly guided caliphs uh, right after the revelation, right after uh, the birth of, of Islam. And to that end, they focus on all sorts of different things, whether it's uh, hadood punishments or the dispensing of, of zakat and so on. But the Islamic State has really been trying to emphasize this, but the tone has been different over the last year or so, the last 18 months or so. It's been really saying, almost mystifying it, making it something that once was. 
And I think moving forward, uh, now that the Islamic State's its territories are no longer contiguous, it's become an archipelago of, uh, of, of much weaker, uh, weaker forces, I think the, the key thing that they're going to be saying is in order to try and keep people interested, in order to try and keep fighters animated, is they're going to refer back to what's been happening these last few years. They're going to refer back to this massive archive of media over these last few years and say, we had this great thing, and then the Kafar, the Crusaders, the Zionists, whoever you want, they came along and destroyed it, and that is why you need to maintain this connection to the Islamic State. That is why you need to continue fighting its jihad. Now, the next video is um, just a, a short clip. It's from a video from the Euphrates province, so that straddles the Iraqi uh, Syria border, and it was released just a couple of weeks ago. Bear in mind that this is an area that the Islamic State has largely been pushed out of now, but it's still an area that the Islamic State is almost fetishizing, again with this mystifying. <laughs> يا إله الكون جئناك حفاة وعراة فاكسنا ثوب المعالي كل من يدعو يلقاه قريبا يسمع الهمس بذرات الرمال يا إله الكون جئناك حفاة وعراة فاكسنا ثوب المعالي وعراة فاكسنا ثوب المعالي so that's nostalgia. The next thing that I think is going to really come to uh, crystallize in the Islamic State's STRATCOM strategy moving forward, its, its outreach strategy moving forward, and the thing which I think it's kind of shifting to, uh, away from this unique selling point of, of utopia, away from this unique selling point of being an organization which is governing uh, and administering and uh, has a bureaucracy, is an overt uh, insurgent government, is this idea of the media bomb. Now, that's its word, not mine. Uh, essentially, this is a offensive information warfare. What it really means is uh, terrorism, essentially. The amplification of uh, an act of propaganda of the deed. So terrorism, killing civilians in order to get the Islamic State's notoriety, get the Islamic State brand out there, show that it is still uh, agitating, still potent, and essentially animate supporters through the deed. Now, the, one of the quotes that they fall back on when talking about media projectiles or media bombs is uh, from a Saudi uh, ideologue, Salafi jihadist ideologue, died in the early 2000s, but he said that everything that angers the enemies of Allah is jihad. So he's not just talking here about fighting. He's not just talking here about shooting or bombing uh, the enemies of the Salafi jihadist group in question. In fact, he's talking specifically about media work. So through media and through aggressive information warfare, through psychological operations, the Islamic State is able to conduct its jihad in exactly the same way, or at least augment its jihad. So what I mean by this is when you see a terrorist operation being adopted by the Islamic State, whether there is any connection between the act itself and the organization, the way that it mediates those operations, the way that it communicates about them, that's not just about uh, scaring its enemies. It's not just targeting publics elsewhere. It's not just talking about the adversary. Terrorism for the Islamic State is as important for its supporters, for the people fighting for it, it's the Islamic State's way of saying, you're still part of the right group. This is still the Salafi jihadist group that you should be a member of. This is still the Salafi jihadist group that is fighting against the enemies of Islam. And I think that moving forward, given that the Islamic State no longer has the territory that it once had, given that it has to find something else to shift to, to find that a uh, unique thing about it that can continue to draw recruits from elsewhere, continue to draw donations, continue to keep the organization alive. I think that this will be incredibly important for it moving forward. Now, the next video is uh, it's another clip from something that was released by the Khair Province Media Office just after the Barcelona attack. This gives you an idea of how within the organization, 
the Islamic State communicates about terrorism, this triumphalist vision. But the problem is these attacks require just everyday items, just a car, no guns or explosives. And with so little planning required, it can be hard to spot them and stop them. Screams and panic tonight on Barcelona's most famous pedestrian street. 13 people are dead after a vehicle plowed into a crowd. The video goes on to talk more about the attack itself, break down the operation into its individual parts, and features another couple of Spanish-speaking fighters essentially saying, this is great, look at what we can do. I think that message, this is great and look at what we can do, is going to characterize a lot of what the Islamic State does moving forward. Whether or not it claims this attack that's taken place in, uh, in Sinai today, um, it most likely will, but it certainly hasn't said anything yet. It, this kind of attack and attacks like it factor directly into this new uh, kind of strategic trajectory that the group is on. So what are the implications of this? I think this is a, a photograph from Raqqa. It shows SDF forces. Uh, driving around a, a central roundabout there. Now, uh, I think there's a tendency uh, and a desire, obviously, to think that we're in a post-Islamic state world. Certainly, we are in a post-Islamic state as it has been for the last couple of years world, but the organization is still very much there. It's changing. It's always been changing, uh, but it will continue to exist. And I don't think we can talk about it having ended. Um, certainly, the organization as it has been has ended, but I think moving forward we have to anticipate that it may go from an overt insurgency to a covert insurgency, one which is focusing more on agitating, more on causing acts of violence to be perpetrated both in Iraq and Syria and outside of Iraq and Syria, to demonstrate that it still has that destabilizing potency, to demonstrate that yes, it may have lost these cities, yes, it may have lost that golden age that it once had, between 2014 and 2016. But that doesn't matter, the group still exists, the caliphate still exists. I think as part of this, terrorism, acts of terrorism, whether they are directed or just adopted by the organization, will be very, very important to it. I think it's probably not an exaggeration to say that it will be its lifeblood, because this is the way that the group has been living over the last couple of years, and it's the way it will continue to be living over the next couple of years, by showing that it has that ability, by showing that it is capable, and showing that it is potent. It's not a particularly optimistic uh, viewpoint, and it does put a lot of pressure on intelligence services in trying to stop attacks from taking place. But I think that there's a lot of evidence that points towards it going down this particular route. And as it does this, we have to ask ourselves whether this will take it even further away from the global jihadism that we became accustomed to over the 2000s and over the last few years as well, whether this will take it even further away from groups like Al-Qaeda or whether it will continue to uh, travel down this particular trajectory or whether something else will happen. It's, um, well, there's a lot of questions out there at the moment and a lot of people trying to provide answers to them, but I don't think anyone really knows what's happening at the moment. There's, uh, especially, I mean, if you look at what's happened in Syria over the last couple of weeks, um, and perhaps we can hear a little bit about this later. The fighters and their families who are leaving places like Raqqa, they're not evaporating. Uh, I don't know where they're going. I was talking to, to Mauro about this earlier as well. Uh, but they're not evaporating. I don't know if they're all leaving Syria. I doubt they're all leaving Syria. I certainly doubt they're all being captured. Um, but. I do wonder whether the Islamic State has been planning for this moment or whether this carpet has been swept out from underneath it. It'll be an interesting thing to look at moving forward. I'll leave it there. Um, thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Sue. Uh, before to leave, to your questions, I have a uh, couple of questions for you. I will start with uh, Charlie. I wanted to ask, um, 
we just saw that uh, the media uh, organization of ISIS is very, very well developed. It's uh, incredible what they built. Uh, I would like to understand uh, which differences there are, if there are, uh, between the message that they create for uh, people that is already affiliated to the group and people that is not affiliated to the group. Okay, so I think a good way to, to look at this is by looking at a publication that it hands out to people in Iraq and Syria, uh, NABA, or has been handing out to them. Um, it's an Arabic language newspaper, 16 pages long, well, now 12 pages, but it's on its 107th issue uh, since the summer of 2015, it's been in circulation. And then comparing what the Islamic State talks about in that to what the Islamic State talks about in its publications like Darbic and Ramia. So those are both English, French, German, Turkish, uh, I won't go on, but they're foreign language publications geared towards a foreign audience outside of Iraq and Syria. And the message that the Islamic State sends in each is very, very different. The promise that it makes is very, very different. In Naba, the jihad that it talks about, the war that it talks about is qualitatively different to the jihad or the war that it talks about in Ramir and, uh, and had been talking about in Darbek. Now, I think essentially the organization is less ideological in the content that it, it dishes out uh, in, in Naba. It's less ideological, it's more conventional talking about war as if it is a war. Now, in the foreign language publications where it's trying to really resonate with uh, an ideologue audience, individuals who are observing the group from abroad that it has to try and keep it interested in the organization and maybe hopes to uh, tap into them as a, a would-be attacker one day too. It's trying to send a different thing. It's essentially frames what's happening in Iraq and Syria in more apocalyptic terms. Uh, there's a lot more theology in these foreign language publications than there is in things like Naba. And I think that's a, a deliberate decision on the part of the Islamic State. It's very, very good at target, uh, target audience segmentation, thinking about who it's communicating to and what their priorities are at any one time. And We just, uh, we just talked about the fact that uh, ISIS lost territory, control of territory in the Iraq and Syria. So uh, a question that of course it came come to my mind is uh, where are going now all the fighters that were in Iraq and Syria and where are going the foreign fighters that were uh, fighting in uh, Iraq and Syria? I remember that we, there is an estimated number of 40,000 foreign fighters there. Um, certainly there's still some battles going on in Iraq and Syria, uh, even in the last couple of weeks where they're trying to push back and have succeeded in pushing back into a couple of towns. Um, but I think the, the message that's getting through to uh, the, the foreign fighters is to go back to where you can be the most useful. I mean, the, the South Asia situation and the number of fighters that we're getting into um, um, Mindanao, where Abu Sayyaf are fighting. Um, I was there last November. Uh, there were a lot of fighters turning up there. This character, Ibsalon Hapilon, um, was one of the guys behind it. Of course, he just um, came to a sorry end in Marawi whilst they were battling to hold on to Marawi. Um, and again, the Mawuse brothers succeeded in Marawi because so many of the fighters from that area flooded in. Um, and it's very open. Uh, there is no sense that the Philippine government can stop that flood of foreign fighters getting in there. And uh, there's been a lot of um, comment about how Rodrigo Duterte is more um, interested in stopping the drug situation than he is stopping that flow of fighters going in. Uh, so I, I don't think there's a simple answer to that. Uh, you know, I certainly think that a lot of the fighters who came out of Iraq and Syria when they were, they were on the back foot um, were flooding back into Europe. I remember uh, covering the Paris attacks, uh, those three dreadful atrocities, and talking to one uh, refugee who told me he had taken him nine months to get from Damascus. Um, he'd got nine different passports, that he'd got fake passports, 
Uh, and on that route, as he was trying to get to Paris, he knew who was within the refugee community that wasn't a refugee at all. Uh, and they were doing exactly the same thing. They were getting fake passports as well. So there's a flow, for sure. Um, and as much as uh, the message from our governments is they're doing everything to stop it, um, you know, I think it's an impossible task, to be honest. I think the, I, I completely agree with you about the, the flow, but I think um, it's interesting that when we think about Islamic State terrorism in, in Europe, say today, uh, or elsewhere, the majority of the attacks, the vast majority of the attacks are being carried out by people who were not in Iraq and Syria, by people who radicalized in their, in their home country. So it's, it's interesting that we know that there are people coming back from Iraq and Syria, but they aren't necessarily the ones that are doing the terrorism that we're hearing about. So there's a disconnect there between, well, what you would presume is happening and then what is actually happening. It's, I mean, this is another thing, another question that... Just to react to that, I'm not saying that they have started committing atrocities. You asked me where they'd gone. And this is where they've gone. Um, I agree. The guys that are doing it are uh, renting vans and driving down bridges across central London or and beyond. Um, okay, uh, just a uh, last question uh, from me. Uh, for, for both of you, I would like to ask if, uh, if you think that uh, at some time uh, there has been a kind of uh, underestimation of uh, ISIS a phenomenon from the Western governments, from the Western countries. I mean, if you think that uh, some, at some moment the Western governments thought that uh, probably would have been easier to manage the group and the phenomenon, then everything just developed in a different direction that they were thinking. That's a big question. Um, well, I mean, I touched on the fact that Turkey was using ISIS uh, to keep down the Kurds, because Turkey fears the Kurds more than anybody, uh, more than they fear ISIS. Um, Bashar al-Assad was using ISIS as justification for getting help from the West to join his war on terror by saying that he was bombing ISIS. Well, indeed, when they looked at the figures as to where his fighter jets were hitting, I think it was 6% were hitting ISIS targets at that stage of the war, and all the rest of it was going on. Uh, the rebel groups um, and there's a lot said behind the scenes as to what was going on with Syria uh, and ISIS and whether there were links there uh, that will become more apparent. Um, as for the American, uh, uh, well the West underestimating, um, well you know we, we just had a fantastic presentation about what what's happened since day one with their, with their social media and, and I think Talking to some of the experts after the Paris attacks, um, they, were, they were scratching their heads, the intelligence agents that I was talking to, not just using social media to um, radicalize, um, to get their message out, but even using um, you know, the apps that you can use to talk to each other. Uh, and at the, the time, the intelligence services couldn't keep a handle on that. They couldn't follow where they were, how they were talking to each other via video games, via, via areas that they just weren't catching up with. Um, I mean, the, the French did admit that they thought the Brits were much better at it than they were. Um, and one other area that they talked to me about was there were quite a lot of guys on their watch lists, but they just didn't have the manpower to follow them. Um, so in reality, when people say they were on a watch list, what does that actually mean? I think this one, yeah, it does work. Um, I think uh, perhaps for a long time, maybe even still now, policy was being formed to try and challenge and undermine a group that the policymakers didn't understand. When we think about, so if, if I just talk about propaganda, for example, it always comes up. Uh, in the wake of a, a terrorist operation or in the wake of some sort of atrocity at the hands of the Islamic State. And it's given this causative 
um, this causative value, as if propaganda alone can cause someone to radicalize, can cause them to go and pick up a weapon, can cause them to go and rent a, a vehicle, and then cause them to go and kill people. Now, propaganda, it's a part of that process, but it is not the be all and end all. And I think even now policy is being formed. Uh, I mean, just going off what uh, our prime minister in the UK said in the wake of one of the attacks in the summer, she was talking about safe spaces on the internet. The problem there was not safe spaces on the internet. The problem there was the network that this group of individuals is already part of. The problem there was the structural issues that gave rise to that network. The problem there was much more uh, convoluted, much more complicated than simply a case of there being safe spaces on the internet. So I think to answer the question, the Islamic State exists on many different levels as an insurgency, as a proto-state, as a terrorist organization, as an ideological movement. And there is no one-size-fits-all policy to, to deal with all of those different levels of the organization, of the idea, of the, the group, of the movement. And I think that that has given rise to some serious issues in the things that have been implemented over the last couple of years. But also, it is in many ways an unprecedented group, in many ways also a very much precedented group. It's borrowed a lot from uh, other insurgencies before it. It's a product of its own history and the history of many other organizations. But I think it caught people unawares. And as something, as an organization that really privileges innovation and, and being agile, it's been very nimble. It's been able to get to these social media platforms that are readily available, but they take a little time for governments to catch up on. It's been able to innovate uh, and kind of encourage innovation in its uh, foot soldiers and people abroad, trying to get them to try out new ways of attacking, new ways of communicating. And I think that that has really played into its hands. So moving forward, I think we need to recognize that there is this continuing innovation in the Islamic State, and it will continue to try and do all it can to survive. And even if sometimes surviving in the short term is materially costly, uh, I think that in the long term it could end up paying off. So these last few years where the Islamic State has emerged, something like a, a flare where it's taken over a large amount of territory, declared a caliphate, and then fizzled out, that ideologically could end up playing into its hands. We just don't know right now. Okay, I think we still have uh, some time for uh, some question from the audience, if there is some question. So thank you very much <coughs> for your great uh, presentation. Actually, I have a question to both of you, so I will be a bit fast. Um, one for Charlie is a bit of a geeky question because, you know, here at the Disruption Lab, we also have a kind of history of working with hacking, whistleblowing, and so on. And uh, somehow, uh, in the kind of, uh, you know, more geeky community, okay, the preferred network for communicating is for sure uh, signal or um, even better something using encryption but uh, telegram has never been considered like the evil one and uh, uh, usual you know you would think that uh, perhaps uh, um, you know, I mean I was really surprising to hear that uh, uh, the member of ISIS are actually using telegram and so I wonder why that is because there is less control than Facebook or uh, I don't know, I, I'm really curious because uh, usually among our group has been considered also a kind of a fair way of communicating, so I wonder where this decision of using Telegram uh, come from. And uh, instead, to Sue, I wanted to ask, uh, uh, I mean, I found really interesting the way you conclude your keynote by saying that uh, the way uh, we should deal with this subject is also to stop demonizing it uh, and trying to understand it. And uh, since uh, by creating this conference, we have been uh, discussing a lot on which kind of terms to use, as I said at the beginning, because uh, you know, even the word ISIS, we were afraid that we were doing uh, a sort of propaganda for ISIS by spreading it everywhere, this kind of word. Um, so I think this also brings us to the discourse that the West has also responsibility in which kind of terms is using in terms of media and journalism 
Um, and my question would be, uh, how can we deal with that? Because if the strategy of ISIS is also to use media to spread a certain ideology, uh, and the Western media are, in a sense, helping by demonizing and using certain words, uh, how could we deal with that in a conscious way in terms of media strategy? So what would be your answer? So just quickly on the, the Telegram question, it's not there because it wants to be there necessarily. So a couple of years ago, Twitter was its preferred, uh, its preferred platform for sharing propaganda because using Twitter through hashtags, you could access millions of people really quickly. Um, but then Twitter decided that it didn't really like Telegram, uh, it didn't really like the Islamic State using it for propaganda purposes. So it gradually booted the Islamic State off. I don't know what kind of algorithms they put into it, but it must be algorithms based on how, how comprehensive uh, that operation was. So the Islamic State is always looking around for different places to kind of put out routes, see where it's comfortable, what, what platform is hospitable. Telegram uh, actually ended up being something which was almost ideal for it in many ways. I should say here also that I'm just talking about the strategic communication side of it. It's, it's the supporters use all sorts of different things um, and often actually leave Telegram. The conversation leaves Telegram when it's getting to really sensitive issues, sensitive matters like logistics prior to operations because it, there is perceived to be something of a, a lack of security for Telegram. But what Telegram has, which not many other platforms do have, is the ability to broadcast. So those channels that I showed you earlier, they act as living archives for Islamic State media. So one of them um, that I'm in at the moment is, goes back to 2015, and it has every single bit of propaganda that the Islamic State produced since 2015. So it enables supporters to, to access things from a very long time ago. It gives them constant uh, ability to consume it and obviously disseminate it as well. It also, because of the, the group function, it means that people can get together, they can share news, they can share propaganda, they can talk about what, what's happening for the Islamic State that day, they can get together. It gives them a sense of community. So Telegram is okay at the moment, but even Telegram has become quite inhospitable to the group um, over the last few months. And what's been interesting is seeing them trying to go onto different platforms. There's a, a thing called Riot, which um, they had a failed migration to uh, a few months ago. And it was interesting because they circulated new links to their official media outlets for Riot. And you could see suddenly there was an influx of uh, people called, well, people with Salafi jihadi sounding names um, to this app this platform which had between five and 10,000 people on it in its entirety. So the people administering Riot, they saw suddenly that there's this influx of weird people who are sharing terrorist propaganda and talking about terrorism, and they just booted them off. They, they saw that it was happening and kind of cut the umbilical cord as soon as they could. So then Telegram went, uh, became, again, the, the main focus of its operations. But these kinds of processes, this innovation is, is ongoing. And I wouldn't be surprised if in the next few months they do go somewhere else. But at the moment, and for the last year or so, actually probably two years, Telegram has been the, the, the app that's been in vogue. I slightly hesitate to, to answer this question because when we've got an American president who uh, is bringing in a, a travel ban and um, approach to um, people that uh, he perhaps fears, because he doesn't understand, um, trickles down to all Western society. Um, I, think, I think it's interesting, when you work for Al Jazeera, you're not even allowed to use the word terrorist. Uh, you probably, a lot of you don't know this, but I am actually a convicted terrorist uh, in Egypt. Um, I was convicted to um, 10 years in prison for um, being, well, supposedly, pushing a terrorist message. Um, myself and a number of Al Jazeera colleagues, colleagues my, I was convicted in absentia and they were actually put in prison for 400 days. Um, and language is incredibly important. Uh, you know, even the way those are a sudden reaction um, in Western news channels when a bomb goes off and if it's a Muslim or if it's um, uh, an American white guy who's just gone crazy with a gun. The language is always 
very different. Um, and I think really we have to be much more responsible with the kind of language that we use. But then I come back to thinking about, you know, the, the fury over the, the, the burkini in the south of France um, and how the French reacted that if, if you want to turn up on, a, on a, a beach covered up, that's not acceptable. And I, I, I'm personally, I just think these things are extraordinary. If I rocked up to a beach in a wetsuit with a, with a hat on, nobody would blink an eyelid. But if I rocked up apparently in a bikini, then suddenly I'm, um, you know, I'm pushing a faith that shouldn't be seen on a beach because it upsets everybody. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, we have to decide how we're going to confront um, what's happening in the Muslim communities, disaffected kids who don't feel that they fit in um, uh, and are ripe for radicalization and, and how do we tackle that? Um, it's, it's, you know, it's something that we have to work out and the, one of the, the first points I would suggest is, is our language. Uh, any other question from the audience? Maybe going somewhere else, but um, it relates to one of the latest attack, terrorist attack that happened in Berlin, where investigation is still going on because the, there has been manipulation in the files and apparently the criminal police has been facilitating the attack. So it's still, it, investigations are still going on and it's not really much spoken. There's not much uh, articles, the media don't follow very much the thing, apparently, or cover it. So I'm curious about how far our institutions are willing to control or have an eye. Uh-oh, somebody got upset. Maybe I said something wrong. Well. Mm, mainly it's about that, how far our institutions are really having uh, interest in clearing out these old propagandas and medias and violence culture that is spreading out of it. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, from, from my perspective, I, I don't know if there is uh, necessarily an appetite um, within governments to facilitate anything like it. And while, I mean, certainly the Islamic State has at times been a bludgeon with which uh, politicians can pursue a, a, an agenda, um, thinking about Trump, um, it's, I, I don't think there's, I, I've never seen anything that's made me think there's a, a big conspiracy at work necessarily. Um, and moving forward, I think governments seem to recognize the critical importance that uh, communication uh, in the wake of an attack, wherever the attack is, uh, the crucial importance that that has both to them as a government but also uh, to the Islamic State as well. So I think there's a lot more consideration uh, more consideration than there's ever been going into how to try and um, not allow uh, the Islamic State as an organization to manipulate uh, the media agenda in a way that it once could. And I think that governments are really, really thinking quite hard about that. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not a, a big one for um, seeing uh, them having a kind of malicious hand in that. Um, I don't know about you, Sue. <laughs> It's probably a bit more difficult because I mean I'm used to being out in the field, not back here, um, finding out what the governments are saying. But I, I would say one thing: um, certainly in the UK, in the old days, um, the the media could be much more readily used and shaped and pushed because we were talking about um, newspapers owned by barons and TV channels run by key people who are in the pocket of, of one branch of, of politics or the other. 
Um, nowadays, it's just not that easy. You know, social media isn't that readily shaped. Uh, and I don't think it's quite so possible for, for them to do what they used to do. Um, I'm no intelligence expert, but I, I just think, um, you know, the freedoms that we have across the world to speak our minds right now um, just make it less capable that governments can tell us one thing and the reality being something completely different. Okay, so thanks, Sue. Thanks, uh, Charlie. Uh, now we are gone, going to have a 20 minutes uh, break and then we will be back with our next uh, uh, panel in around 20 minutes. <laughs>